You're listening to 94.4 FM, Safford City Radio, the Friday Sports Show, with your host, Jimmy Petruzzi, bringing you news from the local area and around the world. And we are very fortunate on this show to have interviews from the world's best athletes, sports people, footballers, people who work across a wide range of disciplines in sport, competitors. Our aim is to increase awareness and participation of sport. We bring South of the world, the world to South. We also have a segment on the show. We interview some of the most influential people in the field of psychology who have been very kind to join us and give us an insight into their work. Today we have a very fascinating guest who's got uh, a really, really extensive background, vast amount of experience um, in sport and related areas. Um, he is or has been certainly a director of football, UAFRA, uh, licensed coach, has a master's in psychology, uh, he's a leadership and talent uh, performance expert, and no doubt he'll give us an interesting insight to his work and what it involves. And also, I'm sure there'll be some takeaways for our listeners, the enthusiastic audience that we have, who are always keen to learn more and know what people do. Uh, David Webb, welcome to the show. Great to be on board. Hi, Jimmy. Thank you for having me. Great stuff. So... In terms of yourself, David, how did you get into what you do? I mean, I know you've had different roles and, and, and obviously you're sort of hugely respected in the field of, of, of sport and football, but how did you sort of get involved in, into doing what you do? Yeah, for me, it started probably back in 2001, 2002, so probably nearly 20 years ago. Um, I didn't quite make it as a top professional football player that I would like, so... At the ripe old age of 21, 22, I still wanted to stay sort of close connected to the game itself because that was my love and my passion. So I started off working, um, at, which was the new AC Wimbledon now, but Wimbledon back then, as a, working as community and schools, and then worked my way up to sort of academy coaching, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then and then progressed through um, sort of the age groups on there, and then went to Crystal Palace and Tottenham and did similar roles. Mm-hmm. and then worked my way up to Head of Youth at Millwall in 2008. And then I took sort of a different route and sort of tapped into really my sort of fascination of um, talent ID and sort of human performance and psychology, and I just wanted to sort of fuse all that together, my coaching experience and mm-hmm. sort of recruitment experience and, and sort of delve inside the character and try and sort of understand sort of elite performers and people in general more because I thought that would give me a bit of an edge so mm-hmm. um, uh, I went on a sort of European study visit to buy a labor coos and I was doing my academy management license at the time and um, it was probably the first time I ever real put use into that side of things from, talent, from the talent ID perspective mm-hmm. looking at the character looking at the character side of things so <laughs> I did um I did a sort of short stint there in, in that sort of area on profiling sort of young elite talent players, mm-hmm. which sort of gave me good in, good insight of not only sort of football abroad, but more sort of elite level characteristic sides of sort of football players. Mm-hmm. And that became sort of my fascination for the next sort of five, six years because I held some really prominent positions of head of recruitment at um, Bournemouth and mm-hmm. at Tottenham. Um, before progressing into more of a sort of a, a structured leadership role as sort of director of football at Ostersund in Sweden and then my last role at um, Huddersfield Town FC. Mm. Now, it's so amazing sort of journey uh, for you, uh, David, that's for sure. And in terms of yourself, I mean, one thing that sort of stands out there is obviously you sort of, you know, were, were, were a footballer yourself and, you know, that you would have the aspirations and, what was it like for you to sort of transition to sort of go into the coaching side? I know obviously since then you've gone on to do a lot of other things and we'll sort of speak about that, but just sort of focusing on that point there where, you know, you, you go from being a, a, a football player and, and, and then you sort of move across to sort of the, the more sort of coaching area. What was it like for you at that age in terms of to, to, to sort of transition? Yes, yeah, an interesting question because... Um I was still pretty young at the time, so it took a. It probably took it probably took about six months to a year to sort of process that mm-hmm. when I first started coaching. I started coaching in schools and the community, and um, I'm working with local sort of um, amateur teams, sort of uh, youth level. And, and what I did find out really quickly that 
um, you know, I had a passion for football and also sort of helping at that time young talent progress. Mm-hmm. Um, and I sort of really enjoyed that that work, and I think that's really helped me in my career working, especially working at grassroots and youth and then academy level, working way up through different age groups because you you get to find working with elite talent mm. at those age groups. Um, fascinating because every club was different every player every young player is different they've all got different needs different challenges different aspirations understanding and and because of my fascination um sort of with psychology and with talent development and those areas in particular to sort of run alongside the coaching side Mm. it became more of a it became more of a fascination than a passion so probably Mm. after about a year or two it became sort of like second nature. So at 23, 24, mm-hmm. um, I was really comfortable at, in those roles of being a, at that time, being a coach and yeah. helping, especially helping young players. I think that, so it didn't take as long as I thought it would mm-hmm. because I found my, you know, I was quite lucky to find another passion that I really enjoyed mm-hmm. and after it- the disappointment of not becoming a player. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And, and I think, you know, you know, certainly for, for many sort of, we have, we have a various range of listeners, and some of our listeners are sort of no doubt um, are playing pro or have looked to play pro, and there's so many variables. But the reality is, I guess, David, you know, for anyone, you know, trying to embark on a career of professional football, there's only so many places available, and obviously, yeah. pretty much everyone wants to be a footballer to a certain extent. That's yeah. a generalization. But in terms of your sort of coaching, you mentioned the psychology. How much does that come into it? Because obviously you've got, you know, only so many places to be a professional footballer. And even if you become a professional footballer, staying there, you know, injury, loss of form, it's competitive. I mean, how much of how much of an influence did, did sort of your, your learning in the field of psychology you have for you as, as a sort of coach and, and development? Yeah, it was, for me, it was um, massive. And it's sort of coming into fruition now, especially at the elite levels, mm. and it's filtering down, which is, which is great. I think there's more of a more of awareness now of of this side of the game, especially with mental health and mm. uh, probably more the, ato- the emotional attachment to these to these areas because footballers, you know, they're quite fragile creatures in a way where mm. you know they go out and perform each week. You know, they're loved, they're loathed, they're hated. They're on the highs, they're down, they're up and down, and you know, they, <clears throat> especially at the top level, they do get paid fast sums, but. At the end of the day, they're still human beings, mm-hmm. um, and they still have sort of the same feelings as you or I or anyone else. So, mm-hmm. I, I think I think understanding that side um, and still sort of treating them like human beings as people. Yes, they're finely tuned athletes and they're elite players, or mm-hmm. if they're young players looking to make a career in the game, I think you still got to have an overall understanding of the person itself behind the player because. And if the player can sort of understand that themselves and start to really understand themselves and their own goals and aspirations and how they mm. sort of see their own sort of journey of self-discovery, I think that can really help them as well, especially mm. in this, because um, it can be quite brutal football, especially Absolutely. You know, in these brutal times that when they're going to face challenges in the game, i.e. not making it or mm. not being picked for the team or being released from a club or... Not, not going the way one at the moment or injury problems various problems but yeah if they can understand help to understand themselves a little bit and um, I found that's what helped me because maybe mm. more, more um, I don't know more emotionally in tune with my you know with the way I was and mm, mm. it might not come natural to some people we might, we might have to work on that but for me it came a little bit more natural which helped that transition but you know my advice would be for any players going through these scenarios and that, mm. that definitely helped me in my journey, and I'm sure you know they can take a little bit of that from from their own journey. Mm, no, that's really interesting. And in terms of say like a role, of performance um, development sort of role, what does that generally involve, David? So that so I mean, I suppose just for our listeners who sort of are listening in, thinking, okay, well you've got a talented player, um, you sort of you know you, you train and 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 you sort of build from there, but. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than sort of nurturing that talent to make sure that you get the most out of your potential. But just as a general like idea for our listeners, what does sort of talent development involve? Yeah, it's um, it's a really 
interesting topic of conversation at the moment. You know, this word around talent and you know what does it mean? Um, and in a football setting, you know, I would see is you know if, when you're looking at talent, what we were about, you have to look at obviously the talent within the sport or the subject they they are first because it's you have to have a, a certain standard if you want to sort of progress on to sort of professional level. So you have to have the basics within your certain parameter of your sport, especially when we're talking about football now. But then you look at sort of be, beyond that, um, then you're sort of picking up on, for me, I, I always, especially in my recruitment um, phase, I, I always I always try to look beyond the player. Mm-hmm. Um, so once I was happy with obviously the technical side and you know certain elements of you know the physical elements and the game understanding and awareness and if it, if it was positional sense if it was more high level uh, once those tick boxes um, were done <clears throat> it was more trying to build a profile around the uh, around the player to, yeah. to try to build some you know look at the more characteristic side at, at certain points you can look at that in games obviously their work rate the communication and um, how they handle certain situations, whether they're winning, losing, or the diversity, mm-hmm. um, and then more, I suppose, more at the highest level when you've got a wider range of access. Then it was trying to sort of um, match environments, really. So, mm-hmm. um, if we're talking sort of first team level at this stage, where you're looking to purchase players, then we had a lot more access and a lot more um, tools to do that. Then we're trying to find, you know, which environment they're coming out of. Yeah. Um, what you know, and under ultimately knowing which environment they're coming into, so trying to give them the best transitional base they could. Mm-hmm. So if we understand where they come from, we understand a little bit more on their background, their home life, their character, mm-hmm. um, even you know the various clubs they play for to see where you know how they've been learned and developed, and mm-hmm. then also understanding their own environment if they're going to be purchased into another club, what they're coming into what can help them settle into that i.e. Mm. obviously the football side should be a match because if you've done your homework um, but then the outside you know, if they're coming from mm. families if there's cultural differences all these little things can mm. help help the player settle into that environment a lot better and obviously ultimately gives him the club and everyone involved really the best chance of of success because I think we're dealing with human behaviour you can never guarantee that um, mm. but what we're ultimately trying try, trying to do is just give them a platform where tipping the balance in our favour so they can go out and perform yeah, and absolutely. that's really interesting you say, and I suppose there's sort of, you know, two ways, it's sort of, I mean, you've got obviously, you know, players who come into the game and they might not sort of have an extensive background in the game or they might sort of, you know, come into a team from a, from a team that's maybe a lower division type thing. But what about the other side of things? What's your thought on, on the other, other way that we got like a player who's playing for, you know, a really, really big club, a huge club, maybe in the Premier League or, or somewhere in Europe, but then they have, they sort of, you know, they, they, they get released and, and they sort of drop down a few divisions. What, what's your take on sort of how players, you know, is it difficult, do you think, for a player to sort of settle in? They've got the aspirations of maybe playing for like a Champions League team and, you know, winning, you know, going for sort of trophies at the very highest level, but then they find themselves maybe, you know, not disrespectful of any other clubs, but, you know, they sort of maybe fall a few divisions down. Is that a big thing for them, do you think, to sort of transition and sort of readjust? Yeah, absolutely, and, and it's kind of a lot of work that, um, that I've been involved in over the years in my career, even at Tottenham, which is, you know, probably in the highest level at the time when I was there, continuously, you know, challenging for Champions League positions, was unlucky not to win the Premier League a couple of times. Mm-hmm. The, the players we looked for, we kind of, at the time, we call, kind of call them, like, like they were a little bit broken so mm. what I mean by that is they um, Tottenham as a club then had a big inspiration but couldn't fulfil the needs of the financial demands of maybe of our competitors at the time with Chelsea and Man United and City Liverpool for example so we had to find a way of um, finding these players and turning them into sort of top class players Mm-hmm. And again, it was just looking for players who had that edge and that spark about of during the recruitment phase. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and that, and then obviously, 
from that environment can then transmit them into world class players. But then on the flip side of that, um, my next role at Ofterson, um our recruitment policy, something we devised for sort of the head coach at the time and the ownership was that we wanted this type of player, a young type of player that maybe has been, a, and we recruited these type of players well quite successfully, that have been at big clubs from such a young age mm-hmm. um, and maybe had some sort of exposure into these first teams at Chelsea, at Bayern Munich, mm-hmm. Liverpool, Tottenham, Man United, various top clubs hadn't fulfilled their potential for various reasons mm. um, at the time but we had the platform in this environment to um, give the chance for these players to, to come and perform and it was like sort of like a second chance really but it mm. wasn't a second chance they were still pretty young 20, 21, 22 because we feel you know they're still very good ages where they've got you know tons and tons of football still to play mm-hmm. and t- their talent is not lost just because they don't reach the clubs at a young age and they don't have exposure at a young age unless they have natural footballing talent. That's that's not the problem. There could have been a number of underlying issues, mm. various problems, various situations. You know, everyone's got their own individual stories on their own journey. They didn't become where they was at that time, but we felt that we could offer that at Austin. Mm. And, 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 you know, a lot of, a couple of players, um, Ravel Morrison was one mm. played very well was doing really well with Derby mm-hmm. um, Charlie Colkey um, Thomas Isherwood all these players that have been a you know, really big club from a young age mm. hadn't really had fulfilled their potential at, at, at those ages they would have liked mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. sort of gave them that platform so I think it's about if they haven't fulfilled their dreams at the big club straight away then it's, it's, it's definitely not definitely not the end or time to panic you just have to reassess and you know make really good decisions of the club mm-hmm. um, but the club choice as well the environment the location you know the style of play all these things have to come into all these elements have to come into play for young players when you're starting to make these kind of decisions it's not you don't have to have the panic of thinking, mm-hmm. I have to get back in somewhere else quickly because usually that's when you make another mistake I think you if you're patient and you're confident in your beliefs and you've got good support around you, mm. good advice, then you know you can make the right decisions to go back to another club, whether it may be one or two divisions lower, or if you go if you're an English club, go abroad. Mm. And then of course, of course, you can come back, you know, twice as strong. Absolutely. And eventually, fulfil your potential. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, that's a great point, and we've sort of seen that this, I suppose, this season with you know the likes of Abraham's has gone to Roma and. And, and, and yeah. you know, so we've sort of seen, um, you know, like you mentioned there, like players that go abroad. But I suppose if it works well, it's sort of spectacular. We've seen the likes of a Cantona at United. He sort of found the perfect fit of Di Canio at West Ham. Great. But on the other yeah. side of things, it's a very careful decision, I guess, you've got to make. Because obviously, you know, if it, if it fails, it can fail <laughs> spectacular as well, I guess. If You know, it, it, so, and, and that's why, is it really important, do you think, uh, David, to have like a team of people who sort of, you know, obviously take all, everything into consideration. Because it is, I suppose, in one sense, I wouldn't, you know, call it a gamble as such, but you bring a player on and obviously it sort of takes, you know, it, it's a big decision it's in, in terms of bringing a player on board. It also has a big impact in the dressing room. And uh, So are these sort of key things to think about in terms of, you know, how will that player settle into the environment? How are the other players going to react to that person coming in? The dressing room, the training ground, all these factors as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, from, especially from the recruitment phase, it's again, um, it's understanding your club, first of mm-hmm. all, and uh, and also understanding the culture of your club, the location of your club, the history of your club, um, the temperature of the current dressing room. So again, communication probably from the first team staff through to the recruitment teams and various other members of the, of the footballing department. Mm. All this must be aligned, so you have clear communication for, throughout that. So, for the recruiters and the talent ID as well as they're going out and, and doing the work for for the club in that phase, they've mm. got a clear picture and understanding of their own their own club first of all, and all the all the elements. And I think that definitely helps when then you're starting to look at players um, because you're starting to look at them from 
the talent point of view from their footballing ability, but then also other other sides because then you know that you've done your homework properly, then, mm. then he could be the perfect potentially a great fit for the club or it might not work out for him for some reason. I think mm-hmm. um, a really good recent example of that is when I was at Huddersfield, we took um, a great talent, Emil Smith Rowe, who's mm, yeah, you know, yeah. flourishing, flourishing at Arsenal. Um, because because I knew his history and then our recruitment team did a lot of work on it at Huddersfield and because we knew his background, um, we knew he'd been out on loan in Germany to Red Bull Leipzig. So we knew he could adapt away from sort of a London club, Arsenal, another big club. Mm-hmm. Um, we knew his history at Arsenal, and at the time, Huddersfield offered a complete different challenge to him, where the team was in a relegation battle. So in the Championship, so he was coming completely out of his comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Um, he was, was going to face a grueling, uh, properly schedule where potentially two games a week, sometimes three games in ten days. Yeah. So, different to what he had played before, uh, and also a test of his sort of his um, his character, learning probably the other side of the game where you've been at big clubs where you're challenging for honours. This time, you know you're in you're in a club where you're you're fighting for your life. So, mm-hmm. and he came in and adapted superbly to that, um, and that was testament to the work what was done by the team at Huddersfield and knowing the player and knowing the club mm-hmm. because. Um, on the outside, because he was quite a shy character and um, there was different elements to it, a lot of people might have dismissed that as not a good fit, but if you delve in beneath and scratch a little bit more and fully understand the player's aspirations and and where he wants to be, and, the, and full testament to him, he came come in and challenged himself in that environment, and um, you know Arsenal was very thankful for that because it helped him build his character mm. and give him you know, exposure of a different type of football which he could take back to his own club. So mm. there's, there's many elements where you can bring this side out of players. They just need the right tests and the right challenges at the right times. Mm, absolutely. And in terms of yourself, your own sort of career, uh, Dave, what would you say? I mean, it's, you know, I, I know, you know, we're going to be several sort of highlights in terms of your sort of career as a professional, but what are some of the things that sort of stick to mind for you in terms of your, your sort of highlights as a professional in the game of uh, football? Yeah, I mean, each club I've always tried to take, you know, some real super positives and some success and, that, and some learnings from it, but um, some individual success, I would say, um, finding talent such as Wilfred Zaha mm-hmm. definitely helped from a very young age because that helped it helped me understand um, looking at sort of the characteristic sides of young players very young and raw talent very young is pure as form mm-hmm. um, and then another one I would say when, when I was a head of recruitment at Bournemouth during the 2000 13 to 2015 period where Bournemouth at that time had just come up from League One. Mm-hmm. They were going for a bit of a transition and didn't have the biggest budget, didn't have the you know the biggest resources, but over a two-year period, and this is when I first sort of really understood how alignment can work so effectively mm-hmm. and having those relationships with um, not only the first team manager and Eddie Howe and Jason and his staff, with, with the ball, with the whole staff throughout the club, the environment, the recruitment team, it was like a collaboration of working together and through that we managed to, over a two year period, I think, spend under £5 million and manage to mm. obtain prim- Premier League status within two years and you know, break all sorts of points, records and other records along the way. And that was just pure collaboration of of all the departments working functionally, obviously the first team, you know, did fantastically well under the coaching with Eddie and his staff mm. and but the whole supporting mechanism around it and being a part of that in a leadership role as head of recruitment was was fantastic because it just showed that them mm. elements without being the biggest spenders, without being the biggest club, um, without being having the biggest resources that mm. these things are possible dreams can happen so that was a that was a yeah. massive talking point and then working with Maurizio at Tottenham I had the pleasure of working with him at Southampton and then again at Tottenham just working with him and his staff and 
seeing um, another side of, of football, mm-hmm. more of a global side of the game. And not only a masterclass on the pitch of how he dealt with high class players, but also it was a masterclass in how you how he personally dealt with uh, players, staff, people in general. He had a real genuine love and affection for people in general. Mm-hmm. And I think that's definitely helped him in his his career of becoming the coach he has become. Mm-hmm. Because not only was he good on the pitch from the coaching side, from the sports science side, understanding all them top crucial elements, that, that human affection and that power he had for people really was, was different from anything I had ever seen and it was a great great um, learning curve for me just to observe and be a part of that mm. It's interesting you say I think I find that fascinating David in terms of obviously you're your own person and, and, and but how much of an influence does sort of working with people like that ha- have on you as an individual um, over the years you've worked with some of those you know some, some huge names obviously some in, in, great people in the world of football and, and beyond even, and how much has that influenced you in, in what you do as a professional, having worked with, with, with some, some of the, the, the people you've worked with over, the, over a long period of time? Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a masterclass really with working with names such as Maurizio, Heidi Howe, and mm. other, other what I'd call top practitioners in their applied fields around, not just football, but around, around the world, because... Mm. I suppose, I suppose, as people, we we warm to like-minded people like ourselves more than we might warm to someone else. So, mm-hmm. you know, I was fortunate enough to, well, especially with Eddie and Maurizio, that was their key strength was people. They were really good, not only really good coaches, they were really good human beings as well. So, I suppose I took that more of a love for their work because I was so strongly affiliated with. That was my passion as well because I have a you know, real deep understanding and the hunger to learn more about, you know, the world around football as well to bring into my career. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's, you know, working and also working abroad, experiencing different cultures um, was mm-hmm. fascinating for me to bring back into, you know, when I worked at clubs in England because to experience different cultures, a different way of life, the way people sort of have their own values and mm-hmm. their own beliefs mm-hmm. in it shows you there's a big wide world outside there beyond football and Absolutely. we can all learn from and I could you know I learned a lot from that and definitely wouldn't be adverse of venturing back out into Europe at some point in my career as well to um, to learn more mm. because for me it's, um, it's, it's a very powerful tool. Absolutely and I suppose you know one, one thing I sort of ask the guests on the show is, is, is like you know what would you say um, in terms of it's hard to give anyone advice. Everyone's on their own path. There's too many variables. But one way to sort of frame the question is, like, say, a younger self type question, uh, David. If you sort of were, were to reach out to yourself as, as a young footballer, um, aspiring to become a professional, sort of, you know, to, 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 you know with all the things you've learned and, and all the managers you work with and all the courses and education you've done on your own journey, what are some of the key things you would sort of say to a younger self? And I suppose. Our listeners, and we have a you know we have a pretty you know big young audience who not just in football but not in, in other professions too and in other sports too. I think it might be useful to sort of hear what would you sort of say to younger self uh, with all the learnings you've had over all the time you've been a professional. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, as a younger self, I would definitely say that um, for me was not making it as a footballer was a great learning curve and mm. it helped me frame my thinking of wanting to become a really good learner and studier mm-hmm. from, from that experience so I think you need to once, upon, once you get over the disappointment and, it, and I think it's to try and to reframe that if you don't make it as your first choice of being a player that there's having a deep understanding that there's so many other elements of the game that you can stay attached to Mm-hmm. And, fall in, and, and fall in love with and that might, might be coaching might be recruiting might be some, might be leadership but I think it's, it's just to try and frame your mind to say right okay uh, this was my first choice my first love it's not the end of the world mm-hmm. there's so much more out, there's so much more out there there's so much more learning to be done and I can still become elite in my 
chosen field and my profession if I dedicate myself to my craft. Mm. So it was it was having that sort of it was like a like a commitment promise to myself mm-hmm. that um, this is the journey I'm going to be on and getting a sort of understanding it's going to be bumpy it's not going to be easy there's going to be lots of failures and how much can I learn from this and sort of keep moving forward that would be sort of my understanding is, is, mm-hmm. is be prepared for the for the fruits of life that your journey is never going to be easy but if you stay committed mm-hmm. in the long term and realise that it's a it's a journey and it's a process and you can take as much as you can from your experiences, whether they be positive, negative, you know, success or failure, that there's that's another box ticked on your own personal journey. And mm-hmm. if you stay committed to that you will get to where you want to be eventually, but you just have to sort of go through the, the pain and suffer a little bit at times. Mm-hmm. But no doubt you will come out the other side. Brilliant. No, that's a powerful takeaway, certainly, you know, for anyone, really, um, and in particular, you know, some of the listeners we've got who probably at this time of year are going to be sort of, you know, told whether they're going to get taken on or, or maybe released or maybe they might, might have found out earlier. But I think that's sort of powerful stuff in terms of, you know, the, the, there is a, a big wild world out there. And, and I suppose coming from someone like yourself, David, who's been there, wore the T-shirt, I think it sort of comes across as sort of a, a really powerful takeaway for any listener because obviously, you know, I guess we, you know, we all got goals, and it's, we might not achieve the goal initially. But like you says, there's, there's, there's a huge world out there. Who knows uh, where the road takes you if you sort of keep focused. And I suppose in terms of yourself, I mean, obviously your vision. You mentioned, you know, you're open to sort of other opportunities on, on, on your own journey. But what would you say your vision is now, David, in terms of sort of going forward? Obviously, you've, you've been at the game at the very highest level. You've been in a number of different roles. Um, where do you sort of see yourself going forward uh, as a professional? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and, that's, and that's what I wanted to do, Jimmy, take on a number of different roles and try and learn as much as I can from them to, to be more equipped, um, to make me more um, rounded in my knowledge base. So achieving the, you know, the goal of technical director and sporting director was, you know, it was amazing, and I'd definitely be open to those sort of opportunities. But if if an opportunity came where maybe I could become a also a head coach or a manager, mm. because my passion also is lies in football, but also to having that powerful connection with with the players also on a day to day basis mm. would be sort of something something for me that I'd really enjoy as well. So both mm. of those areas are, are fascinating to me. And, it would also depend on the club, and um, I'm not too bothered about the, the name of the club or the size of the club. All those elements, I think, it's about the people mm-hmm. and and the connection that you can build, um, not only from the players and the staff perspective, but also upwards as well when you're working with CEOs and ownership and boards, mm-hmm. and then extending that to the wider range of community. So those those are the two areas I would you know that I would I would look at in more detail and mm. yeah if the connect if the connection was there both ways then I think you know it could be a good could be a good fit. Absolutely and and and, and with your experience and also the sort of your sort of qualifications you've done the sort of coaching license in psychology and or, you know and, and I suppose that the biggest education is sort of being out there and doing it as well, you know, living it and as well so you know for sure it's it's uh, we'll, we'll certainly uh you know watch this space dave that's for sure but it's been very kind enough to, to for you to, to join us it's, it's been fascinating no doubt for our listeners i've certainly uh you know um as you do take a few notes down jot a few takeaways down for myself really we're all learning we're all developing really to be fair that's the sort of key but i really want to thank you for coming aboard the show david and sort of wish you all the best uh for your uh, future career going forward no, oh, thank you very much, Jimmy. It was an absolute pleasure being on. Brilliant. That was David Webb, who was kind enough to, to, to join us on the South of City Radio Friday Sports Show, 94.4 FM, with your host, Jimmy Petruzzi, bringing South of the world and the world to Southford. Our aim is to increase participation and awareness of different sports.